first thing I want to say to everyone is thank you. First of all, I'm going to tell you as an administrative team and a teaching team, it's refreshing to be talking about this kind of stuff tonight versus the other thing that has dominated our attention in these public schools over the last couple of years. So we welcome this conversation and we're excited to talk about it. And but thank you for that. And then I also want to thank uh, especially the folks that came to the board meeting back in July and brought these issues forward to us. It's very important to us that uh, every chick child every day is having fun, is engaged, and learning at their best optimum rate. And real concerns were brought to us, and we appreciate that. And we are committed. To getting better, we're also committed to sharing with you a lot of the really amazing things that are already happening here in this building. It's one of those things, right, that when we um, opened up this building back in 2020, we really couldn't do a proper grand opening, right? And, and uh, we never really have had a grand opening of this building that would have given us a chance to let everybody see it, let everybody gain a better understanding of what uh, our mode of learning looks like at Tom and John Elementary School now. So this is an overdue conversation, and uh, we're excited to have it tonight with all of you. So we are, we, we are videoing the event. So for folks that couldn't make it tonight, um, there's 1,800 parents at Tom and Elementary School, and we really want this message to go out to all the parents at Tom and John Elementary School. So they're uh, aware of what's happening, aware of all the great things that are happening in this building, aware of uh, some areas where we're working to get better at that. Okay, so uh, Roger, Roger, Kathleen, thank you for being here to do that. So let me give you a little bit of a, an overview of, of what we're going to cover tonight. First of all, we heard you at the board meeting concerns about co-teaching, concerns about class size, Concerns about uh, the student experience, kids on the floor, where's that coming from? Right. We heard that, and uh, we want you all to understand what's happening, where that's coming from, and I think shine some light on really a lot of things that are happening in this building that are going to be new to a lot of you. So um, I'm going to start tonight by giving a little bit of a history of how we got here. Bill Town Elementary School. And then Ms. Davis is going to talk a little bit about the concept of personal, personal, learning, personal learning experience and co-teaching. And then we're just delighted that uh, two of our teachers, Lynn Williams and Aaron Bluey, are going to come up, come up and talk about what it looks like for your students day to day. So you get a better understanding of what your students' experience is like. And then we're going to uh, kind of close with a panel, give a chance for folks to uh, express concerns, answer questions that um, you may have. Um, but also, you know, I, I, want, I want you all to understand, you know, we understand the concerns. All of us, not only we're teachers, superintendents, we are um, we're parents too. So we, we know, we understand where you're coming from, your concerns. There's nothing that there's no greater trust that you give to other people than to send your student off to school. There's nothing that compares to that, right? Three of our five school board members have students in this building. So believe me, my bosses want to make sure I'm doing a good job for their kids. Uh, my job literally is okay? So I want, we really want you all to understand we know where you're coming from, your concerns, what I make this a dialogue, an important dialogue, so you understand a lot more about what's happening here at Town and Town Elementary School, and then uh, also can help us make it better and better. So I'm going to plan. All right, good, thank you. So, um, that's the other, the other thing I'll say is we're gonna, we are going to um, end the meeting at 7.30. We might end it before that, but uh, we just so we get our staff and team home. Time to spend some time with your families that are ready for your kids to go home. So, it's a 
that are really done by silicon. So we'll probably go to the next slide, Adam, which is the first slide. So that's, the, the other thing we're going to do tonight, too, is we do have a video that shows some of our, um, some of our action, some of our kids in action. That video was actually shot yesterday. So um, we'll, we'll look forward to that as well. Next slide, Adam. OK. So why do I have 2012 on this screen? I think it's an important milestone for our community to some of us will remember. Some of us uh, are relatively new because we didn't understand what 2012 meant. So 2012, Town of City Schools put on a bond levy to build a new elementary school uh, down on the David Bacon site. The brand new elementary school. Essentially, uh, what, what was driving that at the time was the condition of our elementary schools. Dunbar and Monroe were in horrible shape. Dunbar, the folks who had school schools in that building, literally had classrooms with plastic hanging in the ceilings and hoses running on the floor because of roof leaks. It was a horrible, horrible condition. Um, and asbestos, there's all kinds of issues with those buildings. Um, so we did a campaign about fixing those old buildings in 2012 and asked the community to support building new buildings. And they rejected it soundly. It wasn't even close. Two, two, you know, two votes to every one vote. Um, so we had to figure out as a district, we need to fix these buildings. Why did this levy fail? And it really came down to is folks, we don't want you fixing the past, who wants you building the future? What does the future of town schools look like? How are we going to serve our kids? These buildings are going to be with us for 50 years. How is education going to change? How is, I mean, think about how much work and education has already changed. So we totally spun our whole approach to how we were going to approach the community for support. So let's go to the next slide. So I'll kind of give you a scrapbook version of what that meant for us, building our future. And what that meant for Townage was public meetings once every month to talk about different topics associated with the conditions of our schools and what we wanted our schools to look like. So, the first picture up on the right, one thing that was interesting we saw was already in our schools, in our classrooms, we didn't have kids in desks anymore, rows of desks in front of a teacher anymore. Classrooms already looked very different. In fact, the classroom was a hindrance to what our teachers wanted to provide to our kids. They often would arrange a typical elementary classroom at Dunbar would be tables spread around a classroom with a carpet in front of the room in front of a whiteboard. And kids would be moving from sitting at their table for a few times a day, spending time on the carpet together, doing read-alongs, working in small groups. It was not even very traditional kids in line. So the other thing we spent a lot of time with, uh, public meetings, was we needed experts to help town and city schools figure out because there's a lot of folks we don't know, we don't know, right? So we partnered with the Ohio School Facility Commission. They happened to pay for about a quarter of the building. It was a grand ball. But they're also experts in what school buildings need to look like, like to support our kids in the future. So the Ohio School Facility Commission, Commission was involved. There's a guy with uh, the sticky notes there. His name is Frank Locker. He's a Harvard. Uh, he's from Harvard. He came and met with a team of about 120 people to talk about what schools look like and what a vision, what vision made sense for town and city school. This is all happening in 2013, 2015. And we finished off with Kent State facilitating meetings uh, at each one of our buildings. We had. Uh, advertisements in the Town Express. The result of each one of those meetings was put out into the Town Express and communicated on our website to try to understand again what that vision of the future was for Town City Schools. So, what does that 
what did that vision entail? There are a lot of things. Let's go to the next slide now. So I'll throw a buzzword at you. I'm sorry, I apologize in advance, but I think it's helpful. High Performance Learning Environment, HPLE. One reason I give it to you is because you can look it up pretty easily on the ODE and the Ohio, the Ohio Facility Commission. Because they talk a lot about it. A lot of school buildings have been built with this model in mind. And it's something we embraced. So we went and visited the schools that had already followed this model. Uh, North Ridgeville, West Stingham. We'll get to a couple of the, the next slides as well. Here's the fundamental thing that, that uh, is, is important, is the school that most of us went to, right, was what's called, had hallways, right? Double, what we call it, double loaded portal. A hallway with classrooms down one side, classrooms down the next. Very traditional factory model of education that was uh, a boom in, uh, in, in the 40s and 50s. Most of those kind of schools were trying to build around those time frames. So the double loaded corridor. The problem with the double loaded corridor is uh, you know, construction cost is about space. Typical hallway, if you all remember going to school, it was just wasted space. It was only used during class changes. Right? So really, when you, when, you look, when you look at what a high performance learning environment looks like, is all the space is learning space. Every square foot. So you move away from this double loaded corridor concept. And you have flexible space that enables large group conversations, Small group work, individual work, every space in the building is learning space. This building doesn't have all this. I'll show you. So, um, so, so, very important to understand. So, this high performance learning environment was a key thing that we embraced as a district when we visited North Ridgeville, we visited West State. When I say we, I mean a group of parents, teachers, community members. Got in a school bus and drove and visited these schools. Go to the next slide, Adam. New Albany was another one down here in Columbus. So these are all pictures from those schools. And you'll start to see that the model um, is, is something that we embrace. And then finally, right down the street, uh, where, where Adam King was from, actually, it was late. It's, it's another school that we also visited as well. So we went there to understand how it worked why they did it, uh, what was working, what wasn't working, all those things. So it's a very important model for us in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, and usable space in the building. Um, it paid off substantially already. And how is that? Let's go to the next slide. But first of all, 2016, we brought this idea to the community, an idea of 21st century schools, uh, consolidated on a campus, and the, the, the bottom of the campus. So we, we had this great opportunity to focus on building schools that they were really the future that we wanted for our kids. Next slide. All right, Ms. Davis, so we did the build, but there's also a lot of work done before these buildings were constructed. And, and Ms. Davis is going to talk about that. Next. So I'll skip over that piece of the timeline here. But that's where that hits. So, no. Thanks, Harry. So, let's talk about what's happened in the last three years. So, this school was scheduled to open March 2020, spring break 2020. Don't be doing mine. <laughs> that's the other thing I didn't want to talk about, right? That's, not, that's, that's the thing we're very happy to talking about much anymore it's clear but it's not the focus of our conversation anymore that's when that's the story was scheduled we were excited to bring the kids they, they, they were excited we said goodbye to gun for our front row and uh we were looking forward to the kids going off for spring break and then coming back celebrating the opening of this new that kind 
haven't changed, obviously. So, what did that mean for the 2021 school year? This is where I'll take the benefit that was, that was massive for us. Town and city schools, unlike a lot of other districts, folks, every day pay five for your kids. Every day pay five. And that's because of this building, because of all the space that we were able to use. Spread them out six feet apart. It's huge. This building is 110,000 square feet. Dunbar and Monroe combined with 75,000 square feet. More of this building is useful for learning space than those two buildings. That enabled us, literally, we had kids in every corner of this building. Right? Keep them safe and keep them learning. Every day K-5 was a huge benefit and the timing and the blessing of the timing of opening this building. The other things that happened too, right? About 30% uh, of our kids were online in 2021 school year. 300 kids were on town online, and we had very limited co teaching because we really couldn't bring the kids together to do it so All right, so move to 21 22. We still have some restrictions, of course, but it was standard to co teach. The big thing that happened, and uh, I take full responsibility for this, is more of those 300 kids, pretty much all of those 300 kids that are on town online came back to school in the 21-22 school year. That was a service that we weren't ready for. We did not have our student-teacher ratio in this building last year was uh, too high in many cases. We tried to fix that in second grade midway through the year, but by the time those kids came back to college online, we were called. My fault, our student-teacher ratio. There's a lot of issues that I heard at the board meeting, and there was more, a lot of that was really around class sizes, where we did have student teacher ratios of 28, 29 kids, which is too high. Board doesn't support it, I don't support it. It's not something we wanted, but that didn't happen in the 21 22 school year. So we are focused and to get better. There's a lot of things we've done this year to make sure we got better. That's adding those four additional resources to this building and get class sizes back down. We added a school site, we used to have three, two, now we have three school psychologists to deal with social emotional issues that a lot of our kids are facing in and out of uh, these difficult times. Added the step special. Um, we reflected a lot on from the feedback from the school board meeting about the large groups of kids. And we did have a three teacher team last year in fourth grade. A lot of success with that, but we did come to the conclusion that was too many, uh, too, uh, too large of a team. And uh, I've decided at this point in our co teaching and the, the model we're following to limit that to two teachers for the school year. So, that's, again, thank you, thank you for the folks for being um, for bringing concerns to us. And then, lastly, is learning space enhancements. We are, again, every square foot, making sure it works. Is it is good for kids? So up above you here, at me, where this glass, it's, it almost mixes with the building. If folks haven't been to the building before, you probably don't even think it looks new. But really, that, that whole space kind of above, above the wall up there used to be open. And there was a lot of noise that came from this cafeteria up into the fourth and fifth grade. It was in the fourth and fifth grade common areas where we hold classes. And uh, the noise was, was bad, so we um, have completely closed that space in this year to make that work as an $80,000 investment. It is paying off big time. Uh, our teachers are very thankful. Our kids are uh, benefiting. So that, um, that's where we are in terms of, so we're going to go to the next slide. I'm going to hand over to Ms. Davis to talk a little bit about uh, why we're going to this. Hi everybody. Um, I do want to, I, I appreciate Steve kind of walking down memory lane. Um, I was blessed to be a part of all of that work, which is fantastic, but I also think I blocked some of that out. <laughs> like the leaky room bed at Dunbar and worrying that, you know, ceiling tiles were going to fall in and, you know, that kind of, I blocked that part. But we are, it's an exciting time. 
for us um, here in Talmadge. So I wanted to share with you a lot of the work that went into leading up to when we were supposed to move in, March of 2020, which is also something I think I bumped out. But um, there was a lot of, there were a lot of great things happening leading up to that. We were functioning as two buildings, but we were functioning really as one staff. We brought all of our staff together um, for professional development in terms of our staff meetings. They were aligned to really having those conversations um, about what is learning going to look like in this new facility. So we even took it as far as we had um, whiteboards, um, large whiteboards, with the blueprint of those grade level suites in those staff meetings. And our staff were looking at the grade level suites and talking about how are we going to use this? How is this going to impact student learning? What experiences are we going to be able to provide with these new facilities? So a lot of work went into that. We had great conversations around 21st century learning and flexible seating and, and um, use of space. We also were very proactive um, in those conversations. Looking at those grade level suites, we were able to say, this transition might be a challenge. How can we proactively think about how we're going to help our students navigate this? So we were really proactive in our thinking as well. We also, um, and maybe some of you we're able to see this at Dunbar and Monroe. If you remember, we knocked down a wall between two of our classrooms in both of the buildings, so we created what we call a mock classroom that would simulate what we were going to be experiencing and what our students were going to be experiencing here in the new building. So we had teachers who you know, built those co-teaching relationships. We also had other teachers going into those spaces and using them um, for, for their instruction as well. So we were really proactive in our thinking and, and had good conversations about how this was, these new facilities were going to impact student learning. So when we talk about making that shift and we talk about 21st century learning, a lot of the conversation was around that whole shift where our teachers are no longer the keepers of knowledge. I mean, our, our kids can ask Google and Alexa just about anything that they need to know. So the shift is really about building those soft skills for our students. And if you had a chance to see our directional system and our portion of a graduate, those really align with what we want our students when they leave us, what we want them to be able to do, to be resilient, to have empathy, to be good communicators, to be able to collaborate with the, of various groups. Um, so we made a conscious effort to talk about how we can provide authentic learning experiences for our students that give them a chance to think creatively, to think critically about something, to collaborate with their peers and with, uh, with adults, and then to be able to communicate and share their thoughts effectively. So we've already seen the benefits, um, albeit for a short time we were essentially functioning in bubbles out of necessity because of the pandemic. But we, all along the way, we're still doing this work and having these conversations about how we can provide these opportunities for our kids. So we're already seeing the benefits with um, our literacy framework, which this building and the master schedule that's able to be implemented in this building has allowed that literacy framework to happen. Something that we never had at Dunbar and Monroe was common planning time for all of our grade level teachers. They have that daily. Every single day, our grade level teachers and intervention specialists have time together to collaborate. So not only are we encouraging this for our students, but we're modeling this as adults. You know, our adults are constantly communicating and collaborating and talking about student needs and, and talking about how we can provide a personalized experience for our kids. So the literacy framework entails um, each grade level is teaching reading at the same time. So before, we, because of the, the nature of the schedule and the specials, etc., um, you know, one teacher is teaching reading while the other is at the special in the same in the same grade level. Now, all of fifth grade is teaching reading at the same time. All of fourth grade is teaching reading at the same time. So that has allowed our literacy 
team, our star reading team, which you might have heard them refer to, um, which consists of two tutors and four uh, title reading teachers, pushing into those grade levels, all eight of our classroom teachers and the intervention specialists are a part of that small group reading instruction. So they're flexibly grouping students across the classroom, but it's based on where that student, that student is at. So their, their groupings change based on their readiness, um, but it's really about providing enri enrichment and intervention in, in real time. So this building and this schedule has made that framework possible, something that we weren't able to do in the past. And then we're constantly um, and consistently monitoring the success of that. Last year, last school year, the 2021-22 school year would have been the first year we could truly implement that literacy framework because, again, we were functioning in a bubble essentially before that. So um, last, this past school year, obviously, we took a really hard look at student achievement data um, through our, our district assessment tools. So, um, and I'll throw a lot of acronyms out here, but um, basically a phonics assessment, um, phonemic awareness assessment, comprehension. We're constantly monitoring the success of that delivery model because it is a change. Um, but I can tell you based on, and, and COVID years are kind of difficult to measure, you can imagine, but certainly because I've had the, um, the pleasure of being a part of this whole process, our, our literacy growth has been substantial. Um, and part of that also is the use of the, program, the foundations and the Hagerty program as well, which was a new addition. So, and then some other great examples, if you've seen uh, Mr. Wood's video or maybe your child was a part of that second grade project-based learning experience where they built, they designed and built a bug hotel, which is actually off the campus. That was a student-driven, student-centered project where they were using those four seats. They were thinking critically, they were thinking creatively, they were working together. Um, it incorporated basically every content area you can imagine. Science, social studies, math, reading, all of it. Um, and that's one of the great um, projects I know we appreciate highlighting. Um, and actually, the, the teacher that was a part of that actually presented in Columbus over the summer as well. So, also upcoming is a walking path and outdoor classroom project that will be happening. And students will be designing that walking path. They'll be designing and have input in those outdoor classrooms and what those look like. And then I mentioned, obviously, not only are we providing these opportunities for our students, but we're modeling this as adults as well through our common planning collaboration. And then finally, this is, this is really where we're headed, um, is, is really providing personalized learning for our students. Um, this is near and dear to my heart because I, I have a, a, what you would call, I guess, a non-traditional learner. Um, he's the kid um, that would be sitting in the window seat all day um, because that he's, he needs to be moving. Um, that's just my learner. It's not every learner. Um, but it's really about personalizing and giving students what they need, but also student ownership, giving them voice in what learning looks like. Um, that's how you promote ownership of their learning. Personal goal setting. Um, flexible learning environments, um, we're obviously standing in a great example of, you know, flexible learning environments. Um, individualized mastery, so students are demonstrating their understanding of a skill or concept at their own pace. Every learner learns at a different rate. Um, so having the opportunity to show their understanding in different ways, but also at their own pace. And then creating those personal learning paths. Learning doesn't look the same for every student, um, and it doesn't happen at the same time for every student. So our goal is to provide a personalized learning experience. And I know Lynn and Aaron are going to talk a lot about providing those opportunities um, in their classrooms. Um, at the bottom, um, personalizedoh.org, um, that just gives you an idea of kind of the work that's ahead of us. 
Um, personalized learning is really a push from the Ohio Department of Education. They put um, money toward um, providing personalized learning specialists that they've sent out to our, our county educational service centers. We've already had multiple conversations with our personalized learning specialist for this area who's going to be working with our staff um, because it's really um, not just here, it's, it's, it's district-wide. It's a systemic um, movement that we need to have conversations about how we can provide personalized experiences for our students, which I feel like is a great segue into um, our teachers, our fifth grade teachers, Lynn Williams and Aaron Louie. So, thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Lynn Williams. I have been teaching in college now for sixteen years. So, I taught everything from third grade up to eighth grade. The only grade I have not really is sixth grade. So, um, I've been teaching with Aaron now six years. I think. So, um, <laughs> a long time. Yeah. Um, I'm Aaron Louie. I've been in town. I taught elsewhere prior. Um, I have taught fourth grade in Talmadge and fifth grade. Love fifth grade. I'm going anywhere. Um, <laughs> and we have created our co-teaching experience actually a long time ago. This is not new. We've been doing this. Your child is, if you have a child that's come up through Monroe or Dunbar, your child has been in this experience. Ms. Williams and I did it at Monroe. We were co-teaching at Monroe for multiple years before we moved to the new building. So for us, this is something we love. It's our preferred method of teaching, actually, to be honest with you. Um, I feel that I've grown as a teacher and as an educator because of Erin. Uh, she builds on uh, she has strengths that I don't have, and if she builds me up, I do the same thing for her. Um, and also, I find having two teachers or whoever is in the room, it allows for multiple teaching perspectives. Um, it allows for your child to see different strategies, uh, to learn from different teaching styles. Usually, they can gravitate to one of those kind of teaching styles or perspectives. Well, even um, if you come in our room, you'll see I'm at one side and Ms. Williams is at the other and we're going, we're gonna solve this math problem and I'm gonna do it the way that my brain sees it and Ms. Williams is gonna do it the way her brain sees it and you're gonna do it the way your brain sees it and the, the kids all start going, oh, Mrs. Bluey's way makes no sense to me and oh, Ms. Williams' way is great and oh, no, that doesn't, it just provides, that's the thing we're trying to get to our students is you have to know how to think, and now learning is accessible to you through any method possible. I know it feels new and uncomfortable for us that we're taught one way of things, and we want that continuity, and we want it to make sense to us, but really it's actually a wonderful experience for your kids to be able to hear, if I don't get it that way, wow, I do get it that way. It's just allowing more opportunities for your kids to learn. So then that takes us into it. We're also demonstrating the collaboration and the teamwork that we're expecting from the students. Um, we, we encourage them to work with others, to share their thinking, to sometimes not get it right, but to take that opportunity to take that chance. We to challenge each day. other, we, we challenge to interject with each today. other and challenge each other and let kids see that happen. What do professional conversations look like? What does it look like to have someone question you in front of a room full of people? That's what we do all day. Essentially, I truly can't imagine teaching in any other way. I, I, I frankly was a, I was a little bit panicked, a little bit scared that we were gonna have to go individual again. And, and It just and isn't happy. best for kids. It's actually harder in some ways for us because you have to work with someone else. You have to be open to accepting someone interjecting and be open to somebody saying things and having different ideas. Um, and so in terms of making our lives easier, it actually doesn't, but it enhances your students' life, truly. It enhances their experience, I thought. Yeah. 
I don't know. I'm stuck. All so right. You're stuck. You can't move. You can't just move. That's okay. So what are some of the benefits of co-teaching? The, the greatest one is, I think, high quality instruction. Our goal is to provide the students with the, the highest quality of instruction, and we feel like offering two different points of view, two different or different teaching strategies, that that's how that can be achieved. Even more than two. We work with intervention specialists, we work with paraprofessionals, we work with other um, professionals in the building. So your, your children are getting a full view of all the opportunities provided. So with, we have a number of other, uh, uh, other examples, I guess, of why we love reason, it. I guess the reason behind our thoughts, behind our thoughts on this, it is a shared responsibility. Um, Co-teaching offers um, a lot of flexibility in the classroom, as we said, in teaching styles and teaching models. Um, gravitating students can gravitate to, to one of us. If one's not available, the other one is available. We said it's almost like a you get a mom and a dad. <laughs> you get two different energy levels, two different um, patience levels, two different sides of things, and we balance each other out that way as well. Like, Maybe you could see this. Oh, okay. And now I see it that way. So they're really getting the best of both of us in that scenario. Um, there's a lot more time with students. Actually, when I was teaching in an individual classroom by myself with no one else in the room, there was a lot of students that I just couldn't get to. When we have more professionals in the room and people that are have eyes on things and are seeing more things, your students are actually getting more time with the teacher than when they're on their own in the room with no one else to pull groups, see things you're not seeing, work with kids. Um, it also, having that other person in the room allows for continuous education, continuous instruction to happen if there happens to be an interruption. Right. One person can deal with it, the other one just kind of seamlessly jumps right in and, and continues to lessen. Yeah. Um, we set up teaching styles. Teaching styles. Um, it promotes inclusion. Um, Erin and I have worked um, with multiple different groups of students, different intervention specialists, aides, different professionals in our room, and it really reduces that stigma of pulling students out of a room. We've created an environment and with our groupings that includes everyone, and students are going to different places for different reasons. And Right. If there's not a stable, it, oh gosh, I have to be the one to, to leave for this. So. Their students are with their peers all day, with the adults doing the work coming to them, working with them. Um, peer relationships. Your kids have a lot. My children go to a larger school district. Personally, I live in a different district. And it, the benefits of your kids getting to be with more kids is really a, actually a very good thing. Um, they have more people to be able to connect with in a room, find their friend group, find their people, find their crowd. Um, we've noticed this a lot less kids are kind of on their own or having trouble finding. You've got more people to work with, more people to be around, more people to choose from. And I think their confidence level in working with other students that they may not necessarily gravitate to is, is offered in this co-teaching experience too. Um, we share knowledge all the time. Um, we share knowledge about the students, their skills, where they're at, and it, it provides us with kind of real time able to teach them what they need in that moment. Real time to kind of shift. We don't teach, I teach math, and Ms. Williams is sitting at her desk getting caught off on work. <laughs> She's teaching language arts. I said, we are, we teach of this fully all day long together. We are both the math teacher, both the language arts teacher. When we have intervention specialists and other adults in the room, they are a math teacher, they are a language arts teacher. Your child is getting teaching from both professionals all day. So our repertoire of knowledge has yes. grown. Oh Wrong. my goodness, I know right. so much more about subjects that I used to teach in isolation. I know so much more from just working with Ms. Williams and her building up my knowledge. And, that's, and that allows us the ability to even adapt and connect to different subjects, different situations, connect it to real life for your students. So, um, next one. Students, 
student support. Um, yeah. This is just us being able to see what we need to see, multiple perspectives on a child. I notice, like, sometimes Ms. Woods, I notice that he's not seeing as well. And I know you weren't noticing it when you were teaching. He needs to move to C, he needs to work, and she needs to have the directions written down. Like, we notice more with each other, whereas opposed to one person having to find, see all that at once. Uh, as we said, we are truly equals in this. And there's, we introduce ourselves at the beginning, you know, Ms. Blay, Ms. Williams, you know, all of the teachers, and any adult in there, they can actually go to, because we're all their teachers. It's not, oh, I can't go to you, or oh, you have to go to this special teacher. We're all their adults, we're all their teachers. And finally, we, it's more engaging. We find that the students enjoy it more because we are having fun. We have get to have a back and forth and we get to a yeah, a little back banter back. back and forth and it's actually more interesting to watch than that one teacher. We get everyone more involved and it's actually a more engaging experience. So overall, um, I just want to say that um, usually starts out maybe like a 10 to 15 minute lesson, whole group introducing kind of the main idea, what it is they are going to be, the students are going to be learning that day. That would be similar to when we were in our older buildings, like carpet time. Coming up to the carpet, discussing as a group, here's what we're going to be doing, here's our goal for the day, this is what we're going to be learning. Then that's in about 10 to 15 minutes. And then based on data that we collected different ways, we then flexible group the students and we break up into groups, uh, usually about maybe like a 30 to 45 minute, 30 to 40 minutes. With multiple usually, groups, right, us groups in rotating the multiple groups during that time with different, every group doing what they are needing and they're learning at their level. Um, we are able to be, reach more students that way. If it were me on my own, I maybe could get to two groups in a day, but with us, we're able to get to all of our students every day. And then, and then we finish up with like a 10 to 15 minute time to where we regroup together, we kind of redefine what it is we did, we reflect on what we did, and we discuss it. Uh, we personally have our students do a lot of writing, a lot of reflecting, you know, what did this do, what was our goal, what did, you know, where are you at in your learning is and what our worked, what did you? What worked, what didn't work. How did your group work together? <laughs> what could we make, how could what we make your different? group work better? These are things that they're going to have to do. They're going to have to be able to work with other people. So overall, we feel co-teaching creates a more personalized learning experience. Um, I think co-teaching allows us to see your student from multiple different angles, multiple different perspectives, to get a clearer, truer picture of your child, rather than from just one perspective. We can tell you that since we've been in education a long time and we've seen things change and grow and evolve and not work and work, we truly, as professionals, are invested in this. We believe in it, we've seen it work, we love it. We, the, we love it for your students and we wouldn't be doing it. We would be pushing back and not wanting to do this. We truly do believe in it and love it and have never, don't want to go back. So just, Trust us, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Lynn and Aaron, thank you. I we can give them a applause. For us. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, so next steps here. So uh, Adam's going to queue up a video. Uh, Happily passed out some note cards. So for camera, for camera shy folks, uh, we want to collect your questions and concerns, and, and we promise to kind of go through those uh, and, and answer those. I think we'll be able to categorize them, and then some folks aren't going to be as comfortable talking in front of the group. Uh, but we will collect those and, and, and get that feedback to all of you. We'll also, uh, for folks that want to ask questions tonight, we'll pass around the mic. We'll be a panel of us and try our best to answer your questions. And uh, if it's something that you know we hadn't thought of or we want to get some more thought to, we we'll promise to also you know, take time out and get, get back to it. Sound good? So if you've got your note cards, we'll watch this uh, pretty cool video.
What's that? No, it's a separate.
Okay, did you get a, get a chance to fill out your note cards? So we'll, we'll collect them. Does anybody want to kind of volunteer with the questions or concerns you want to bring to the panel? Okay. Like co-teaching, or is it just a specific one? Like my son, does he have a co-teacher or not? Uh, so good question. So kindergarten, right now we have uh, we have one co-teaching classroom, and then the rest of the classrooms are individual. So. Oh, uh, Mark. <laughs> Hi, I'm Megan Arbor. I just moved from Worthington two years ago. Arbor is probably a familiar name to you. My mother-in-law, Carol Arbor, taught in town much for her whole career. So my daughter, Paige, is attending as a kindergartner. 900 kids in a building is a lot. How many students were planned for when the building was planned? And how to accommodate with the new housing developments that seem to be cropping up and wanting to crop up? It's a great question. So this, this building is rated for right over, a little over 1,200 kids. And we have around 1,100 in the building now. Yes. And um, so I, I would tell, you know, a couple things. Um, I know there's concerns about population and the new housing. And I have those same concerns, especially on slide. Quick additions of kids. So, a couple things. I've been here now 12 years. One of the first conversations I had with one of the board members is, Steve, how are you going to expand that high school? How are you going to expand that high school? Because everybody's going to move into Talmadge, and you're not going to have enough room. We had 1,000 kids in that building when we started Talmadge High School. We opened Talmadge High School 15 years ago. We have less than 800 today down substantially at Talmadge High School. It's because the nature of families is very, very different. And that hurts us, actually, folks. All right? We, we, it hurts us. And I'll tell you how it hurts us. So there's a healthy level of um, enrollment in Talmadge City Schools. Um, so there's too much, and there's too little. Too little, part of it is funding. You, you, you know, you, you lose kids. You have to cut costs. Part of it is options for your kids, right? We're blessed right now. Like adding the STEM teacher here, because of a, a little bump up in our numbers over the last couple of years, is is driven by that. That enabled us to add that STEM program for our kids, which is really kind of awesome, right? So, um, so there 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 is a there is a balance there. Um, now, certainly, uh, this, this building can probably handle another 100 kids, maybe 200 kids, comfortably. Right? We, would have to, we would have to do some things if it jumped up beyond that. Again, that rate of change is my, 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 bigger, my bigger concern. I will tell you right now, again, we have... Look, just looking at the search in the building right now, we have close to 200 kids, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Right? There are 152 in kindergarten, and about 170 in first grade. So, you know, I don't know what that wave means, but this is kind of an odd wave that we have less kids in, in first grade than, than, uh, than we typically have. And then we have you know, dips at the sixth, seventh grade level. So, we're, I mean, we're watching it very closely, but. At this point, again, we need healthy enrollment here in Talmadge City Schools. Um, we're, and we're finding that just the size of families and, uh, and, and again, the wealth quotient also in Talmadge is jumping up as well, which uh, is good for the district in terms of funding uh, as well. So, hope that helps. I just Simple question, a simple answer that I think most parents here are looking for. I know that kids move in between work groups, work areas, um, from one of the common areas to the classroom and back and forth. Is there a seat and a desk for every student that you put into any given work area at a time, or are they being forced to sit on the ground and have assigned floor spots? or crates 
instead of seats in tables. A common question. So I'll let Mr. Booth my hand on that. But we uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, and we have filled this question quite a bit. And first of all, thank you all for coming in and do appreciate it. Uh, you know, I've been here a little over a year now, and this is what makes Talents great is, is the involvement. We would rather have people that are involved and concerned uh, than under involved and not concerned, quite frankly. So this is what makes Talents great. Um, yeah, to, to answer the question, yes, there is, there is a desk, and there is a seat for every child here. As you've seen in the videos, and the, the testimonies of our teachers on how they use those spaces, it is a little bit different. And it is the, the use of, I know that the carpet time term over the past couple weeks has kind of been a, a hot button term. Um, it, it's part of the flexible seating approach that we use. Uh, some kids really enjoy the carpet time. Um, you know, when, when that time comes up, if you were to walk through during the, the school day, you'll see some kids that they're in desks and some kids that are choosing to be close. Sometimes you'll see a room full of empty desks as they're using that time to, you know, have kids sit closer, use that carpet time, whether depending on the age level, if they are, you know, sitting listening to a story at a younger time. Um, we do a lot of social emotional lessons daily, you know, it's our goal uh, because there are a lot of social emotional needs that we need to address now and educate in that way is important. Um, it's, sometimes it's a math lesson, sometimes it's an English lesson in the, in the format uh, that Mrs. Williams and uh, Mrs. Louie just shared where it's an introduction. Um, but yeah, if a student preferred, hey, I, I don't want to sit on the carpet, there's a desk there. Um, sometimes carpet spots are assigned, sometimes they're not. It depends on the need of the student. Maybe they're, they want to be up front or need to be up front. Maybe there's certain separations that the teachers have to decide. But uh, yes, there, there's desks available, there's seats available. Uh, in, in all the areas, yeah. Just to clarify, whenever we put work groups together for any reason, or any time those students are together, whether the individual classroom or co-teacher or anything, there is a seat at the table for every student in that classroom. At the same time. At the same time. There's always an available area. So there's a couple areas that we see. If you get a chance to tour, right. No, and what I'm talking about is if, if we were up there, we're up there at this time, there's two classrooms that, that are being co-taught in. There's desks, there's seats right out there in that collaborative area for the whole class to use. If they were to choose, and, and teachers are choosing different approaches as, as part of the, the flexible seating, the flexible learning, all those flexible education type of styles. Some of those rooms, they, they decided to use more for carpet areas, so you'll see more desks in the other area. Other, we have, we have lots of different styles of rooms where we have a room here that they're using where they have all the desks in there with a, a wall that can be open and closed. So there are different types of areas and they're using different approaches. But they do have access to those areas, whether it's in, inside of a classroom that looks more traditional, but maybe it doesn't have any desks in it because they're using that for more of that carpet type approach, or they can use it out in that collaborative area, which again is really a learning area. It's, it's a classroom if you're up there with that glass in there. It's not a hallway. Um, it it's really feels like a classroom up there. And yes, there's enough desks out there as well. Yep. What method is the carpet in a great approach of learning? Because some of the teachers are choosing to use and why haven't the parents been offered? Like that's not going to It's interesting that the carpet time has become a, a hot button issue. Right. Like right. And, and, yes, and if you're and, and the carpet time thing is something that great. Or great flexible seating, we'll call it whether it's a, a wheel seat or a regular desk or it has wheels or some kids that like to sit on the carpet. What's wrong with the desk? It, like, there's certainly nothing wrong with the desk. It as an option. Why? Certainly. Like what method is that? That's what makes it, it flexible. Some kids, as you heard the, the testimonies of the teacher, some kids prefer to sit at a desk, some prefer to sit on a carpet, some actually like sitting on different types of wiggle schools or crates. So it's, it's that personalized learning experience, but the, the sitting on the carpet type approach is not a new one. It happened all last year. Uh, it's happened for decades, I believe, at the elementary levels where it can bring the kids closer. Uh, it just gives them that more, maybe even intimate experience where instead of sitting at a desk in the back of the room, which might not be good for a kid, it gives them a chance to come up, be in front of the teacher, uh, and, and just move around. 
be quite honest, most elementary kids want to move around. They don't want to sit at their desk all day long. If a kid wanted to, they, they could probably make that an option where they would be at a desk for most of the day. Of course, we're moving around to our, our different classes, our recesses, our lunches, so they, they'll move around regardless. But some of them like to have that. Some, sometimes I'm at the desk, sometimes I'm at the carpet, sometimes I'm in a wiggle chair, sometimes I'm on a crate if that's an option. Um, but they, all kids are different. And that's something that we didn't grow up with learning. Uh, I know I grew up in rows with desks and, and we all sat and learned the same way. And I think research has shown that definitely this is a different generation, they're different than us, and I think it's, it's a better way of learning to give them those options. Yes? It's more of like a comment, I think, than a question. But so what you're basically telling me is that we're kind of teaching our kids to like, sometimes I feel like going to school, sometimes I don't feel like going to school. When I was in school, you were forced to go, you sit at the desk, you learn, and then you go home. You're kind of giving them the option to go be lazy on the road, not pay attention. The video, the little girl is in there playing with her shoes. I just don't feel like they're actually sitting there focused if they're playing on the ground. So I'd like to know how that's actually being beneficial for our kids. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like choice is important in education. Um, you know, and, and sometimes finding what the right choice is is a process. Um, but the co-teaching model is conducive to finding that student that maybe is off task. And that's kind of what this presentation was all about, was the co-teaching model, and helping find those kids' needs and what's what's best for them. You got a, you got a point? Yeah, I just have a comment. So my daughter actually has ADHD and anxiety. Um, and we're learning that if we're at the dinner, she wants to stand and eat. If that gets her to eat, let it be. If she wants to move around, tie her shoe, play with her shoe, she's actually learning because we have been learning that and um, that's like a big difference because we'll be like, Mia, did you hear what we said? Repeat what we just said to you. And she says the exact thing because she's focusing on what makes her obtain that information. And actually, um, I totally love your guys' way of learning because that gives her, I want to be able to stand to do this. I want to go do this because this is how I'm learning and obtaining that information that you have to sit in this desk and look forward and you can't be doing this, this, or that. It gives every child a way of how to learn. And I'm like 100% into this learning. Um, we actually moved last year to Akron for a low spirits. We finally was able to move back to Talmadge and my child has actually loved coming to school every day because she knows that she's safe, she's comfortable here, she loves to learn, and yeah, I'm 100% like right with you guys. Thank you. There sounds like other folks, I get it, aren't as bought in on it, and I, we hear you. So, um, you know, we'll, we will continue that conversation. It's an important part of what we're offering here is that flexible seating, moving through the spaces. Our teachers will tell you their goal is to engage your kids every minute. So whatever mode uh, best achieves that is what they're working to do. So uh, maybe we can move to a different topic. You mind? Thanks. And then a secondary teacher in the district, so I can do all But I do have a question. Um, last year, my daughter did experience a kind of power dynamic issue with her co-teachers. Is there something that's set up within or, you know, I know that it's kind of a new concept for the whole building, but is there something that's right to address that within the teachers and with how? <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, I'm running up behind yeah, you. Great, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have co-taught before, too. I know. Yeah, yeah. That's a really great no, experience. No, I. It would be awesome, but if you're not. Yeah. Right no, I, was, I appreciate it. And, and we didn't pick Aaron and Lynn because they're the worst at this. Right. right. Sure. To come and talk to you. All right. <laughs> So, you know, so, um, yeah, let, I'll let Courtney talk a little bit about that dynamic. Thanks. Obviously, I'm passionate about this. Um, but, but I will say 
Um, and I, I joke that co-teaching a relationship is like a marriage. I mean, it, it really is. Sometimes it works really, really well. Um, and sometimes there are things that you have to work through. And sometimes it requires uncomfortable conversations. And we've kind of lived through all of it um, along the way. And there are some marriages that just don't work. Um, so you kind of regroup and, and, and reconfigure and make it so that it does work. Um, but certainly that's a learning process along the way, without a doubt. So, um, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. Like I said, Lynn and Aaron have um, worked hard on their marriage. <laughs> very strong, independent teachers. And so when we started co-teaching by choice, it was interesting to see us work. I was surprised, she was surprised, like, wow, this is what we're doing this. Like, and we're both very strong in our beliefs. So, yeah, it's, it, you definitely have to have a whole conversation. So is there like specialized community that's offered for the teachers, or like, what are you doing to help yeah. those? Good question. Yeah, there's there's some counseling that happens <laughs> along the way, but no, in all seriousness, um, unfortunately, um, through the pandemic, PD was kind of put on pause because there weren't a lot of places offering professional development. We couldn't really send anybody anywhere because no one was getting together. And you, you know, even though there are webinars and and things like that, you know, online courses, it's it's different to be physically there and, and network and have to open and honest conversations with people who have lived it. And so we're definitely um, working to provide those professional development opportunities. We've already built in um, professional development opportunities around providing authentic learning experiences for our kids. So our teachers have been working over the last several years around um, project-based learning service learning opportunities. Um, but as it relates to um, co-teaching professional development, it's something that we're consistently seeking out. And now those things are becoming available because you know everyone's kind of come out of their bubble, so to speak. So that's something that we're doing in an, in an ongoing way. Professional development is, is really never ends. I mean, in this profession, we have to be constantly learning and growing and improving what we're doing. So it's something that never ends. Um, but we're, like I said before, we're also going to be doing a lot of professional development around personalized learning. And personalized learning is, is that is kind of a big umbrella, and co-teaching is under that umbrella. So a lot of the work that we'll be doing related to personalized learning will address the co-teaching um, practices that we're engaging in. Oh, I'm sorry. So we're newer television, we've been here for a few years, and I have a fifth grader, so it's kind of targeted that way to you guys. Um, it's a two part question. The first part is is, co is the co teaching model using grades 6 through 12? And then the second half of that question is if it's not, how can you prepare the fifth grade students for the transition to a different teaching model of what? They do, they are using the co-teaching model approach up in six through eight. Um, I know that they have uh, departmentalized, but they are co-teaching. So we are kind of preparing that does continue on down through middle school. Thank you for saying that it's this I think we have this idea of co-teaching as this completely radical, different experience that these kids have ever had in their life, and it really is not. Um, it's really just, it's the same, you're getting the same quality teaching, it's not a humongous difference. I would feel like it's going from a co-teaching model to not, it's not going to be as significant difference. Thank you. It's the same It's more of a, a professional Um, so I don't envision it being a, being a shocking transition just because it's really not that shocking. It's not drastically different. It's just you have two professionals in the room. Oh, there's a question. Yes. Going 
coming from. Okay. Uh, so I believe um, I, I, they are in pots. I think. <coughs> oh, sorry. All right. Our fifth graders are in kind of the transition year because we follow the middle school schedule and we also have access to the middle school exploratory or special teachers. Um, our fifth graders travel completely on their own and go to a new exploratory parkway group. They visit two exploratories every day. So they go on their own to maybe band first and then halfway, at the end of band, they leave and they go to art. And then they transition back to the group. So they do get that independent transition experience through that. Um, we also, have, they practice it when we transition from different sp learning spaces throughout the building. Like, oh, we're gonna go down to we're gonna have a smaller go to this room to work on something more targeted. But the exploratory, honestly, they're transitioning even more because they're even going next door and they want to be Um This may just be me. Uh, I I don't think that I think maybe you guys just wrote the communication of some of the concerns. I hope that there's four teachers in every classroom. It's it's the teacher to student ratio that people are concerned with the space, the seating, the accommodations. Um, I, I hope you two work together for the next 20 years, but I hope you have 19 students to each of you. And I hope that they all have desks, lockers, chairs, and you can move them around your classroom freely. Um, I think that's, and I may be speaking out of turn, but I think that's what most people are looking at. It's not co-teaching that's kind of in people's heads. It's, the fact that the classroom size is a huge equal for two teachers. Um, and my question is, what are the current, what's the current average classroom size, or I'm sorry, we'll say student to teacher ratio. And out of the top performing districts in this state, uh, which we are not even in the top 20, what is their ratio? I can't, I can't speak, but as I mentioned in the, in the thing, student-teacher ratio is was too high last year. After the influx of Talmadge Online kids came back, our numbers were too high. That's why we added four additional grade-level teachers over the last year. That's what brought our numbers down to 25. It's even less than the um, kindergarten. What's the kindergarten now? 22 at kindergarten. So I think you'll find if you look at a Revere or a Hudson, they're right around 22 for kindergarten um, and 25 for the upper grades. I think that's an average for. I, 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 I know there's plenty of other districts out there, and some of my colleagues have worked at them. There's over 30 kids in the class. So 25 is, a, I think, a healthy number, an appropriate number for, for schools. First of all, I appreciate the efforts that are being done to improve teaching. And anecdotally, I've got four spies in the school, so I see what happens quite a bit. They are, I don't know if you trust them or not, but if every classroom looked like the demonstration we just saw, it would be great. However, what I fear and what I'm hearing is most of the time it's one teacher lecturing 50 students, and another teacher in and out of the room making photocopies on their computer. What's being done to Good question. I would tell you that I think you're describing the exception, not the rule. Um, but that, Ms. Davis, why don't you talk about some of the professional development and all of your doing? Um, not to say this again, but there is definitely some some work to be done, whether that's around professional development, whether that's having honest, hard conversations. Um, I'm obviously not here on a daily basis anymore. I do miss the kids terribly, but um, I'm not here uh, on a daily basis anymore. So I do want to. I want those who are here on a daily basis to hear. I want you to hear from them in terms of what they're what they're seeing. So uh, the situation that's being described, uh, as far as 
one teacher leading the room. I, I'm not seeing that at all. I, I just have not seen it. We're around a building, we're very visible. Um, we, we see two teachers in the classroom, we don't see one that's leading at all making the comment. Um, you know, is everyone as good as our, our experienced ones here? Are they, are, some of them are still learning, and, and you know, we, the, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. But um, absolutely not. I, I can just answer that. that I do not see that. Uh, a lot of our teachers leaving the room and then leaving the other ones to instruct. Now, if they're not leaving the room, are they engaged? Yeah, I, and, and it is going to look different. There are different types of co teaching models. Um, where these two, sometimes that's rare where two are teaching at the exact same time, bouncing ideas off each other. Another, there's, there's several very effective models. One is where one is instructing and the other one is facilitating around the room, catching those kids that maybe are, we need a little extra help, a little extra intervention, or maybe just not paying attention and, and can't help with that as well. Assisting as far as the actually teaching at the same time. Parallel. Yep. I just want to say too, the expectation is that the adults are engaged in the lesson as well. Um, in terms of like having time to, to plan or to make copies, those things should be happening during their common planning time. That time is built into their daily schedule. I'm not saying there isn't an instance where maybe one an adult needs to, to run to the office quickly or something like that, but I want to be clear that the expectation is that the adults are actively involved in the lesson. And that can look a lot of different ways depending on what's being taught, the lesson format, the lesson design. It can look a lot of different ways, but the expectation is they're engaged with the students. Yes. So according to the ODE website for the Town and Newport Park, there's no appreciable difference in the reading and math scores for the 2021 school year compared to previous years before. However, when you look at last year's test scores, there's a significant drop of a 10% decrease in our scores. And if you look at the ratio of students at different levels, advanced proficiencies, that the amount of students in the basic and limited groups are growing. So how do you believe that the current class size is going to support improving our test scores and helping those lower students? It's a great question. Certainly, we watch data very, very closely. I think you know, the very difficult thing with the year examples you gave is filtering out the impact of the fact that 300 kids were on town which online and uh, just everything associated with with that in, in the pandemic. So, Ms. Davis, you don't mind talking a little bit more about that? She's, she's, she's the data queen. I, I do not want that title. <laughs> but um, I, I would say, obviously, we use that OS, it's, it's tied to OST, obviously. So we do use that as a temperature gauge, but where we're putting our, our eggs, so to speak, is in the basket of that day-to-day progress monitoring, the local assessment tools that, we, that we're using, that our teachers are using to make informed instructional decisions. But to uh, Mr. Wood's point, we had 300 students who returned from, from Talmadge Online. And to be completely honest, their learning experience was not the same as the learning experience that those kids who were coming physically to school looked like. It, it looked different. Um, so we also, um, had the challenge of those that were learning at Talmadge Online, we had to offer the Ohio State test. We couldn't force them to come in and take it. Um, and those who didn't take it, um, unfortunately, were, were counted against us. Um, so there are a lot of variables that, that obviously go into that data. But just know that it's something that we look at. We, we certainly want to use that as a temperature gauge to, to make decisions. Um, but ultimately, the day-to-day -day and instructional decisions are coming from the teacher observations, the teacher assessments in real time as well. Um, with that said, it, we definitely want to see an improvement in those test scores too. And if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing um, with intention and we're making informed decisions, we should see those test scores rise too. The other piece to consider is, is those students that 
you know, we're returning from Thomas Online because it, that, it, that instruction looked different for them. Um, upon their return, we obviously were filling some of the gaps that they had from, from the Thomas Online experience. So, did you have some follow up? Yeah. So what are the best marks then that indicate to you that this large class size is not an appropriate learning set? So we have a variety of tools that we're using. Um, to, for example, I mentioned um, the literacy assessments that, that we're administering um, three times a year. Um, the Dibbles, if you've heard that reference by your child's teacher, um, the Dibbles assessment, the uh, past assession, assessment, which is a phonemic awareness um, test, um, and also um, the QPS, which is a quick phonics screener. So those are the data pieces that we're really using um, to help kind of inform our instruction, and again, the day-to-day. -day. Um, and then we also, this is the first year, we'll have a full-time MTSS coordinator. Um, who's taking a look at individual students meeting with the classroom teachers and the intervention specialists, and that kind of ties into our um, personalized learning experience. So we're tailoring the interventions to their needs um, and able to provide, and not just that, but those that already have mastered that skill or concept, that we're providing enrichment opportunities for them. We're challenging them and pushing them forward because not only the the do we need to provide interventions to those scoring in the limited and basic range, but we need to push those um, students forward who are in the accelerated and advanced range. Um, we, have, we need to push all of our learners forward. So, um, and you know, in terms of benchmarks, um, we're constantly referring back to our, our directional system and our portion of the graduate, and one of the things, one of the pieces that we're planning to do is create kind of a metrics of how are we measuring that we're creating, um, you know, that we're providing these opportunities for our students, but and also that they're leaving us with these skills and that they're ready for, you know, whatever the world might look like when they graduate. So those are ongoing conversations that we're, that we're having as a staff. We're also within that common planning time, it's very data focused too. Um, not just OST and the other literacy assessments that I mentioned, but their classroom observations and their classroom-based common assessments, too. Can you talk about FBI methods? Yes. I know. I, I have a tendency to put on that. I'm so sorry. Um, MTSS is a multi-tiered system of support. So it's really about meeting students where they are and tailoring interventions to whatever their need might be. But it's really a team-based conversation. So the intervention specialists that we have in the building, the school psychologist, the, guide, the, the school counselors, the classroom teacher, everyone is a part of that conversation on a student-by-student -student basis. How can we better meet the needs of this student? Um, because it, it takes a group sometimes to talk through different, different strategies. Sometimes a teacher reaches a point where they feel like, I've used all the tools in my toolbox. What else can I do? And that's where these conversations really are beneficial. Great, we probably have time for two more questions. I saw one in the back, do you still have a question? Yeah. You do, and then we'll do this young lady here. Okay, I actually don't need that. I gotta be loved. <laughs> All right, go. Let, me, let, me, let me get her for us. So my question builds off the gentleman that talked about the co-teaching and his spies reporting that one person sitting at the back of the room while the other is teaching. And this was very much our experience last year. I sent emails, I communicated with the teacher. What are we doing for the students that fly under the radar? So my kid is sitting in a classroom with 50 plus students. She's confused and lost, but she's not disruptive, so it's not recognized, and we continue to fall further and further behind. I'm just a frustrated parent because I don't I don't know what I'm supposed to do to help her. I kind of tutor, like, and I'm expressing that, like, it, she's not me. She knows how to look at me, and like, she's getting what's happening, and really, she wants. Well, for you, you and I can chat. I want to help you. 
Okay, but why don't we, we lose a couple answers on that just a general question. So, do you mind, uh, Nicole? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Coy, our assistant principal. Thank you, Nicole. I think this one is up. Yep. Thank you for all of you for coming. We really appreciate it. And I think what I was sitting here listening to is I'm also kind of into data. I work a lot with the third, fourth, and fifth grade. And what, and this all ties together in my mind because without the building structure that we have, we could not possibly offer the star reading team support that we do. And that is a huge piece in our building. Um, it doesn't, it, it starts at the beginning. So it starts all the way down with our K building those foundations and helping them get there. So we haven't seen the full effect of it yet. Um, but it's coming and it's coming quick. The rapid growth we're seeing in so many kids. I was on the phone with a parent just today when we were looking at the math growth. And, you know, even if they were a little below the mean, um, the average percentile, their growth was huge. And, and we can attribute that to the ability for us to group kids. We were over here doing some quick math, and when we have, during that reading block, which is one of our key instructional focuses, um, we're down well below the one to 20 ratio. So in some cases, we were just kind of doing some math. We're down to one to 13, one to 12, and when they're instructing, they're easily down to one to five, one to four. So there's a lot of really individualized instruction. That's gonna go a long way to help us show growth on you know, all the different metrics that we're using, and it's going to filter us into OST, the Ohio State testing that you know, we were discussing a few moments ago. Um, the other key piece is, we really do take some time to look at comparisons and with the different metrics we use, the different assessment pieces, a lot of them give us norming references. So we can see how we're doing compared to national norms, we can see how we're doing to, compared to state averages, and we are doing well, often well above um, our peers. And so that was really exciting news because certainly being new this, um, just this last year, trying to get my understanding of who we are and where we're going, we looked at all of those pieces and we showed that um, we know that the averages have been dropping. You know, we have seen those different uh, subsections being lower, but that's a state state concern, not just towns, Ohio, and we definitely um, made, took time to look at that and really evaluate. And honestly, um, you notice too, our co-teaching team, this, these two ladies, they banter back and forth. Yeah, that, that takes some time to develop, but all of our teachers are really working hard um, to build that comfort level, and it's come a very long way in a quite short time, so we're excited about that. Thanks, Nicole. The young lady doesn't need the microphone. You can be the last question. <laughs> so I am a teacher in a neighboring district, and I hear a lot of like class sizes. I teach a class that has 30 students in a class, okay? It is what's happening everywhere. Um, I would love to be able to have teachers come in and help all the time. It's just not feasible. So I hear things like tax dollars and things like that. Like, there's just not enough money. So I just want kind of everybody to remember that, but like kind of to end it, what can parents do? Because I hear a lot of like, what's the school doing? But like, this is a great community. I would love to have parents come in and helping like Tom the I don't have that. Uh, I've never had that. And so just like, what can the parents do? Well, let's have more conversations like this. First of all, I mean, again, um, you know, I, I could thank everyone for coming out. I hope we answered some questions. Maybe we created some new questions. Maybe there's uh, certainly some, still some concerns in the room. I feel that. Um, my commitment to everyone is we are going to work to get better and better. And um, we, uh, we feel really great about strides we've made over the last three years and um, we feel uh, really great about um, the progress for, for your students and the experience that we're creating for your students. Again, fun, engaged, and progressing academically. Um, I think the way um, you can help as a parent, number one, we do not hesitate to call us. We don't have any system. Phone rings in my office. Call my office and make a voicemail. I will get back to you. So we want to hear if you're, you're not your child's not having a good experience. We want to hear it. Miss Davis the same way. Mr. Booth, Miss Coyne, Mr. Ravina. Um, we are here to help answer your questions. If you your spies give the information, we want to know about it. We can we can we can address it. Um, we we're working hard to get better and better. We're not perfect. 
Uh, but we think we're doing a, the best we can for your kids, and we'll continue to do that. So, um, again, thank you for coming out tonight. We'll collect your cards, and I hope to hear and see you again soon. Thank you.